So Ray's suggested that the energy equation might be an area of weakness or concern. It's seen about the page 102, 103 area. Also have the speed or the light formula. Actually, if we want to just go ahead and walk through the module, can remind, maybe remind you all of some things that we've covered so far. We started off with the Crookes tube, discovery of the electron, cathode ray, corpuscle, whichever name. It started with corpuscle, but it ended up with electron. Electron is the negatively charged particle of the atom. That's on the first one, two, three, maybe four pages of the module. The idea that like charges repel, opposites attract. Again, that's grade school science right there. That everything has a charge. Everything has charges. Let me put it that way. Everything has charges. Whether or not it has a net charge is based on whether or not the charges are balanced. So if I have 500 negatives and 499 positives, I have a negative one charge. Everything has charges. The question is, are they balanced or not? And if they're not balanced, it becomes important for our work in chemistry. Determining the number of protons and electrons in an atom. Well, simple. How do we determine the number of protons that are in an atom? We have to use a tool. Periodic table of elements. So any element up here, how do I know how many protons it has in its nucleus? Mm -hmm. Atomic number. Atomic number tells me how many protons it has in the nucleus. And if it's a neutral atom, meaning it's not an ion, it has a balanced charge, then how many electrons does it have? Same number as protons. Now we get into neutrons. What is the charge of a neutron? Neutral, right. The charge of, of a neutron is neutral. As a matter of fact, we talk about the mass. That's one of the questions in your review questions is which put the elements or put the particles in their mass order. You can kind of think of a neutron, if it helps you remember it, think of a neutron as a proton and electron stuck together. Because in terms of their mass, it actually goes from neutron is the most massive to proton and then the itty bitty electron. Okay? But neutrons have a neutral charge. Do does any given sample of an element, if I have a pure substance, a pure sample of an element, does every atom of that element have the same exact number of neutrons? Or maybe back it up a minute. Does every one of them have the same number of protons? It has to. It's not a pure sample if it has different neutron or different protons, because if it just has different protons, then you've got a mixture of different elements. So if I have a pure sample of an element, every atom has to have exactly the same number of protons. The number of protons that designate that element is how many it has to have. If I have anything that has more or less protons, I have a mixture of different elements in my hand. But if I have a pure sample and they're all the same number of protons, do they all have the same number of electrons? Not necessarily. They could have more or less electrons each, which would make them ions of each other. So don't, necess don't necessarily you know, you can say they would neutralize, but not necessarily have the same number of electrons. What about the number of neutrons? Not that you can have an isotope. They would all be isotopes. They all would be isotopes. There is no such thing. Remember, with electrons, you can say it's either neutral or it's an ion. An ion basically means it's not neutral. Every element is an isotope, has isotopes of the same element. So you would absolutely have different numbers of neutrons in your hand. That's why these atomic masses are such large numbers, because they're weighted averages. Every atom would have the same number of protons. Every atom could have the same number of electrons. Not every atom is going to have the same number of neutrons. The difficulty is, when you have multiple isotopes of the same element, that chemically they function exactly the same. So the difficulty is if I decide I want to have a pure sample of just one isotope of a certain element, the process of separating out all the other isotopes is incredibly difficult. And that's where we started talking about nuclear, nuclear fission or nuclear material for bombs. 
start talking about the fuel for bombs. That's why it's so hard to make that fuel is because what you're trying to do is get a high number of a particular isotope of the same element. It's very, very, very hard to do. Yes, it's one of the uranium isotopes. But you'll have a question, or there is a question on your review section, for example, that lists five or six different chemical symbols. Three of them are the same, and two of, are of, of another one. The question is kind of vaguely worded. It says, which of the following are isotopes? Well, the answer technically is all of them. Every atom is an isotope of some element. What they're actually looking for is, let's say, in that list, there's two or three of the same element listed with different masses. And then you say, oh, okay. Here are three different, say, lithiums. Here are three different lithiums, and they all have a different atomic mass. So these are three isotopes of lithium. That's why there is no standard, absolute standard for each element. So you can't say this is the pure one, and these ones are isotopes. Everyone is an isotope. Because it's, remember, I said it's relational. The book uses the phrase, it's a relational situation. It's not that this one and this, this, is the, this is the right one, and this was the ugly stepchild, right? It's that this is an isotope. This one is related to it. They're both the same element, and they're both isotopes of each other is a way to think of it. This is an isotope of this one, and this one is an isotope of this one, and they're both isotopes of this grand family who all have the same number of protons each. So that's one way to think about isotopes and neutrons. So in that, remember the, the practical way of figuring out the number of neutrons is take the atomic mass, subtract the atomic number, and that'll give you the number of protons. It'll be fractional, but you'll have to figure out, okay, let's say if, if your answer is, hey, this, this element has 11.2 neutrons, what would you put down as the answer? 11, because it tends towards which whole number. On average, it would be 11. That would mean occasionally there's a 12, but usually it's 11. Okay. But for the most part, what we're going to give you is go, would probably be whole number atomic masses and whole number atomic numbers, so you just simply do the math to compute the difference. But maybe be able to explain why is it that sodium has a 22.98977 as opposed to a 23. Finding the atomic mass. You won't have to find the atomic mass. You'd be given the atomic mass. Mm -hmm. Or the other, let me put it this way. If you had atomic mass minus atomic number to get the number of neutrons, right? Mass minus number to get neutrons. You could always do the work the other way. Given a certain number of neutrons and an atomic number, what would be the mass? This plus this is this. This minus this is this. Works both ways. But this would be the simple formula right there. Mass minus number equals number of neutrons. Rutherford's experiment. Remember Rutherford was shooting alpha waves out of the gun. The gun was just a box with a pinhole in it. Put something inside of it that emitted alpha waves. Those alpha waves that came to the lead box and were in line with that little hole went through. Then later on he had another, another target, another piece of material with a hole in it. So it again took that beam and only let a certain really small number through. He sent that on to hit a gold piece of foil. And he had around that a ring of fluorescent material. It fluoresced whenever particles hit it. And he expected that when he shot through, that the particles would go straight through and hit on the other side. He was surprised because they deflected and they ricocheted and they moved all over the place. And as a result of that, he came up with the nuclear model. Went from the plum pudding model to the nuclear model. And the nuclear model just simply says, we have some model now that has a nucleus and things around it, as opposed to it all being just like this plum pudding or blueberry muffin. So the idea that there was negatively charged and positively charged particles within within an atom that had distinct locations was Rutherford's, one of Rutherford's contributions of the whole model. And again, it wasn't, it wasn't definitively known as the only way or the absolute truth, but it was the only model that they could come up with at the time that explained all of the information that they received from their experimentation. 
So then we moved on to light and the principle of light because we were yet to come to this idea of excitation and de-excitation with the emission of a photon. Yes, well. It, because gold foil is it's a very malleable material because it's a metal, right? And their purpose was to try to get a, a metal that was as thin as possible. And so remember even then they said they worked it so thin that even though they couldn't tell, they estimated their common wisdom was, hey, this is only a few atoms thick. I mean, it wasn't like a piece of aluminum foil. I mean, that, that would have been hugely thick. They, they pounded this thing down to get it as thin as they could, as thin as possible without breaking through because they wanted as few particles as possible for the alpha wave to pass through on its way to the target or through the target on its way to the reflective field. We started talking about light, the particle and the wave models. We talked about the particle wave duality of light, that light sometimes behaves like a particle and it sometimes behaves like a wave. Then we're on page 99 looking at waveforms. And again, waveforms are hard to draw freehand on the board. I probably should have an overhead projection that gives me a nice consistent wave. But as you look at a waveform, there's certain pieces you need to know, like there's a cr the very top of the waveform. I'll draw a rough one here, but we have from peak to peak is a wavelength, the symbol lambda. Okay. Around the center, from the center point, there's positive and negative movements, and those are amplitude. If it, if it was done right in the scale, the amplitude above would be equal to the amplitude below, about the center. So you have a wavelength, amplitude. Again, the wavelength is going to be the same between any two identical points on the waveform. Could be from top to top, but it also could be bottom to bottom. It could be from crossing center line to crossing center line because it's a symmetrical wave. It's the same across the wave. If you had another wave, and again, it gets complicated when I try to draw wave over wave. But you could see if I took this wave and I scrunched it together, <coughs> brought it together this way, the wavelength would get smaller. But for every second of time, more waves would go by. Think this is your t-axis. This is your time. So if I take it and I scrunch it together, the wavelength would be smaller, but it would be passing by more quickly. And I use the example of my hands to talk about frequency. Frequency is like in music, tempo, right? I've increased the frequency. If you think about every time a peak goes by as a clap, as I scrunch it together, the wavelength gets smaller, but the frequency goes up. So squeezing it makes the wavelength smaller and the frequency higher, which is from this relationship right here, we can see that wavelength and frequency are inversely related. If we say the speed of light is constant, it's a physical constant, it stays the same for our purposes in this class. That the wavelength times the frequency is the speed of light, which means if wavelength gets smaller, frequency goes higher. Because I'm not clapping for you, so for those of you that think that's funny, but when you multiply these two things together, they have to be a constant, okay? They're a constant, so if one gets smaller, the other one has to get bigger, otherwise we're changing the speed of light which we're going to say for our purposes in this class, we do not have the authority to do. And there are several times during the course I'm going to say that. You're doing something that only God does. You're doing something that only he can do. You know, and he'll go like, what? Okay, trust me, we'll get there. You're trying to do something that only God can do. God gives us the ability to rearrange things. He doesn't give us the authority to change his constants. Um, so C is the speed of light. C, speed of light. C represents speed of light. It does in chemistry and in physics as well. C is the speed of light. They, they're not equal as they're being, like for example, compressed and expanded when we talked about the redshift, it was in the video. But for the purpose of us assessing a, an individual wave, it'll be in a constant state. So I'll just ask you constant state uh, compared to another constant state. As a matter of fact, we did talk about a couple constant, take, constant state comparisons. We said if one waveform has a long wavelength and another waveform has a shorter wavelength, how do their colors compare to one another? So you've got a long over here, and see we had another one that was shorter. Again, if I 
if I, if, I try, if I were to try to draw two wavelengths, let me try to do two completely one, different ones, but smaller, just so we can compare them more easily. Let's say I've got one that looks like that, and another one that's twice as many beats per second than this one. Pretend their amplitudes are the same, but this one has double the frequency of this one. Okay? If we look at our, these, let's say there's your both visible light waves. Okay? They're in a visible spectrum. Which one is going to, and they talked about two different shifts of color, right? There's a red shift and there's a blue shift. Okay. Do you remember the, the name or the acronym we were to, to, re, to memorize to remember the different colors? Roy G. Biv, right. So Roy G. Biv, Roy G. Biv is wavelengths from Long to short. Long wavelengths to short wavelengths. Matter of fact, on page 100, they give the visible spectrum, and they have red over here at 700 nanometers. And they list violet at the other side as 400 nanometers. So red has a longer wavelength Violet has a shorter wavelength. We talk about taking a wave and making it and stretching it out longer. We talk about shifting it to the red. It's a red shift. And we take a wave and we compress it and make it make the wavelength smaller. It's a blue shift. Remember, the red shift is that idea of a motorcycle coming past you or a car coming past you. You're standing by the side of the road and here's something coming up, coming up to you. And you hear this sound, a high frequency sound. <coughs> It gets louder as it gets closer to you, and when it passes, it goes, Eow. That is an audible red shift. Okay? As the, thing, as the vehicle's coming towards you, the sound waves in front of it are being compressed slightly, which is taking the actual sound of the vehicle and shifting it to the higher frequency, lower, you know, um, a smaller wavelength, which is a higher frequency. And then as it passes you, the physics of it take the wavelength and they stretch it out. It goes from high to yong, it, it goes lower. That lower frequency, that, that sound frequency that goes lower is the same thing that happens in light, and the light color shifts towards the red. We're taking the wavelength and we're, the waveform and we're stretching it out, okay? But for our purposes right here, I've got two wavelengths here, or two waveforms here. Which one is going to be redder than the other? One on the left is redder because it has a longer wavelength. And it, the other way to think of it in the inverse is it has a smaller frequency. Has a larger wavelength, has a smaller frequency. Yeah, they're both true. This one over here has a higher frequency, which means it has a shorter wavelength, and it's going to be bluer. So if I have two lights, for example, and this, is, this shows the light coming from both of them, if they're the same amplitude and one has a higher frequency, that higher frequency, the color I see is going to be a bluer color. Okay. So if I looked at this and said, hey, this one here, actually, if I told you this is yellow, this waveform here is yellow, would this one, could this one be red? If this is yellow, this one has a higher frequency, has a lower wavelength, what colors could this be? What colors would they have to be? Would they be to the left or to the right? of yellow. If it would be bluer, it'd have to be to the right of yellow. So this might be green, it might be blue, indigo, violet, we're not sure yet because I haven't told you what the frequency is. But if I told you this one is yellow, then this one would have to be to the blue side of yellow. Okay? If I told you that this one here was yellow, then this would have to be red or orange. It would have to be to the red side of yellow. Red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, violet. So you can keep them in order. So you could say, hey, the bluer side, the redder side. If, if I have two lights and they have exactly the same frequency, exactly the same frequency, so in terms of when they have their beats there and there, I have another waveform under, underneath it. Let me do this one. I'm going to superimpose a second on it Let's, so it has the same frequency. It's a little easier to do.
Okay? So I have a second waveform that's inside the first waveform. It's got the same frequency. It crosses at the same points. Its peaks are at the same points. Its troughs are at the same points. But it has a smaller amplitude. Let's say the, the big one is A1. Let's say the smaller one here is A2. The second waveform has a smaller amplitude. What can I say about it, how it looks to me? Let's say this is light again. How does it look? What changes? And it's not going to be its blueness or its redness. Something else is changing here. So if I'm looking at this light, and I have a second light come on, and I have to compare the two, and they're the same frequency. Since they're the same frequency, they're the same color. Okay, so they are going to be the same color because they have the same frequency. However, yes? The higher amplitude is the energy, and it's going to be more, there's going to be brighter, right? So let's say that this is a red waveform. If I had both these lights in a room, and I'm looking at them, lights are off, just those two red lights, I'm going to see two red lights that are the same color. One of them is going to be brighter than the other one. The brighter one has the higher amplitude. The dimmer one has the lower amplitude. They're the same color, which means they have the same frequency. Okay? So you can do this with lights. You could have a rheostat that changes the frequency. And by turning it one way, you could make it redder or bluer. And another one which changes the amplitude, which makes it brighter or dimmer. And in your homes, you know, you've got dimmer switches. Still make those, right? You don't say, uh, you know, whatever, dim the lights. No, we, if you actually have them on the wall, there's either a slider or a button that you push to turn it on and then you turn it to make it brighter or dimmer. That is a rheostat which is doing this. It's making the amplitude greater or smaller to make the light brighter or dimmer. If I had another one, again, that changed the frequency, I could make the light bluer or redder. The E equals HF can be scary only in that it's math and it uses times 10 to the negative ninth for nanos. But really is just a straightforward application of the formula. You can see examples of that on 103. That's using um, both these formulas, the light formula and the energy formula. To remember to get, you may, you may see on a test, you may see a, a light spectrum that, that shows you the different wavelengths, like on 105, it shows you the different types of waves. And the electromagnetic spectrum, they consider that all to be light. Okay. Do you need to go? The visible light, we think of light as visible light, but they use the word electromagnetic radiation to talk about all light. And that includes everything from gamma all the way down to radio waves. Radio waves are light waves for our purposes here. And the difference just is, what is the frequency? What is the relative frequency? What we can see is only a portion of the light spectrum, the visible light range we have. Now, there are animals, for example, that see infrared. They see things that we don't see because they have the receptors to see that light information. And if you're in the military or something, you use infrared goggles, use uh, night vision goggles, use different type of things like that. Some of them just amplify the local light. Some of them give you the, the ability to see light spectrum that you don't normally see. It'll take that light and they'll shift it into the visible spectrum so you can see it. I know it's out of your time, but that's what happened like on S Star Trek Next Generation. You got Jordy LaForge. He wears that visor thing on his, on his eyes, over his eyes, because his eyes don't work. But he has this, basically, this camera array that allows him to see much more information than other people can see because he can detect all that energy and the visor trans translates it into information that his brain can use so he can actually see things that the rest of the crew can't see. And there's one episode where he gets his sight back, which everybody would think, hey, Jordy's not been able to use his eyes to see. He gets his sight back, but when he gets his sight back, he feels like he's crippled because up until that point, he's been able to see much more information. And so to get his natural vision back was actually much less than he had with his technical technology helping him, okay? So this, I think the formula e equals HF is scary only because it has big numbers on it, but the math is pretty straightforward, as is manipulation of the C equals lambda F, frequency, wavelength, and speed of light. Speed of light, 3.8 times 10 to the 
I always mess that up for some reason because I'm so used to using 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd. It's 3.0 times 10 to the 8th meters per second. That will be given to you. You don't need to memorize it. That's part of it too. That will be given to you on the test if you need to, to, need to know it. Well, we finish Wednesday, right? Wednesday is the last day before fall break. So it's going to be before. It would be Wednesday at the latest. Mm -hmm. You'll also be given H in this formula equals H times F. H is Planck's constant, so that would be given to you. You may not be given your light information in terms of frequency. It might be given to you in terms of wavelength. So what you would need to do is use this formula here, C equals lambda F. Use this to convert your information from wavelength to frequency and then put frequency into this formula to give you the energy. So that's why these are both, both written at the same time, or both often used together. If I say this waveform, it's a red waveform, it's got se it's, the wavelength is 700 nanometers, you need to be able to convert 700 nanometers into so many hertz of frequency, because this formula here uses hertz, not wavelength. Energy in joules, and remember hertz is a derived unit, it's how we say a one per second. How many times does something happen every second? Lights are tr normally around 60 hertz. Okay, means when you hear that buzz, that's a 60 per second hum. This waveform that's making that noise is cycling 60 times a second, and it produces that 60 times a second produces that amount of noise, that that frequency of noise in your ear. Yeah, it is annoying, I know. For people with good hearing, it drives them crazy. It drives me less and less crazy as I get older. From there, we talked about light. Go real quickly into, um, because we use light in terms of the electrons and the different orbitals, because we, have, we came up with this idea that Bohr had, or using the Bohr model, where you've got a nucleus and electrons rotating around it, that if we were to have electrons in different racetracks around the, the nucleus, and we were to excite the electrons, the frequency, or excuse me, when we excite the electrons by giving them energy, okay, and we give them energy normally by using electrical charge, but normally for, for elements, we heat them up. And so we give them energy by heating them up, but the energy has to go somewhere. It, can't, it doesn't just cease to exist. Something happens when you add energy. In the case of an atom, when it receives energy, the electrons become excited. And once they reach a certain level of excitation, they will actually jump from one orbit to another orbit. But because of the principle of ground state, that everything wants to be at its chillest, its do the least work possible, okay? What happens is that that electron that's been excited and moved out to a higher energy level because of the excitation, then suddenly becomes de-excited and wants to fall back to its normal position. But it can't go down unless it releases energy. And so it releases energy in the form of what? When the, when the electron releases energy, we can tell it's done that because we see light. And the light that's emitted is going to be in relationship to how much energy it's given off. And what it gives off is the same amount of energy that it took for it to move up or out to the higher energy level. As it drops into the lower energy level, it emits, a l emits light. And that light has a particular wavelength that we can see, which is where spectrometry comes in, because we can figure out what an element is by the light that it gives off. And the light that it gives off to us looks like a single color, but using a spectrometer, it can break that up into the different frequencies. Because light that we see is seldom one frequency. It's often a combination of a whole bunch of frequencies. And what we see is the net effect of all of them combined. But the spectrometer, the spectrometer breaks that up into individual frequencies. And by looking at that, you can see the unique fingerprints of every single element. Okay, So that's why we need to understand light and what happens when we excite it. And when it goes through de-excitation, the emitting of the light particle so we can see the frequency of it and then be able to figure out what it is, which is how we can know what a star is made of that's light years away, just because we can analyze the light that's coming off of it, the different frequencies of light that we see. That the light that's given off is in very discrete frequency bands. 
or wavelengths. Two ways to think of the same thing. Very discrete wavelengths. And those very discrete wavelengths correspond to the amount of energy needed to take it from one level to the next level. Because remember, it gives off the same amount of energy that it took to get it up there in the first place. Boom, boom. So it takes a certain amount of energy. It can't move till it has enough to make the whole step. Boom, it has enough to make the whole step. And then very quickly, get rid of this. Poof, falls back down to where it was before. The energy that it gave off was the same amount of energy it took in. Because energy can't be created or destroyed. It has to be converted. So it's converted into light. We can see that light and we can say, oh, that electron needed this much energy energy to make that step. So by seeing the step pattern, we can see the different amounts of energy required to go to each different level within the orbitals. The orbitals have different shapes. The S orbital has what shape? An S orbital. It's a spherical shape. It's a ball. All these are three-dimensional shapes, remember. So the S orbital has a sphere. The P orbitals are, what have I described them as? They look like dumbbells, propellers. There's three orbitals, and they orient themselves in the X, Y, and Z plane. So if you were to look at it on the board, there would be one orbital this way, one orbital this way, and one orbital coming straight out of the board and going back right through the vertex where they cross. So you'll have those six different lobes. The sphere, or every orbital, can only contain two electrons. So the S orbital at each energy level can only contain two electrons. The P orbital is actually the P orbitals because there's three of them. Each one of them can contain two. So P orbitals together can all hold six electrons. After the S and the P, we then have the D. The D has how many different orbitals within it? It has, it holds 10 electrons. So it has five different orbital shapes each one holding two, and then higher even still is the f orbitals. The f orbitals are seven different shapes. Each shape can hold two electrons, so it can hold a total of 14 electrons. Okay? So, given all of that, we talked about how that the electrons, if we were to construct an to construct an electron configuration, that's what we're getting into now, constructing the electron configuration for any given atom, we first of all need to figure out how many electrons we need to place. How many homes do we need to find? Because I'll sometimes say these different locations are their addresses. Everybody gets their own house. Okay, how many electrons do we have to place? We can look at any element, look at its atomic number. If we assume that the element is neutral, we have to place the same number of electrons as the atomic number in the electron configuration for that element and that the electrons are going to fill in a particular order. Now that particular order tends to be in the order that they're listed to a point. If you just fill them in the order that I'm about to list them, you would actually come up with an error because they don't fill real neatly S, then P, then D, then F. That each, each element has energy levels. Large differences between one set of orbitals and another set of orbitals. So you can think of this as major jumps in energy versus more minor jumps in energy. The energy levels, I'm just going to write about the first five on the board. And again, this is much review, but because next week is a kind of a shortened week, we need to kind of put this in now. So I'm going to say there's five energy levels. What are the orbitals that are in the first energy level? We have s orbitals, right? Are there any other orbitals in the first energy level? No. Okay. And there is an s orbital at every energy level. So every one of them starts with an s orbital. Every s orbital has the potential to house two electrons. And so I'm going to put a two up here. And what that signifies to me is that it can hold up to two. Second energy level, what orbitals can it contain? S and P. As can, potentially, every other energy level. The P's can hold up to six electrons. Are there any more in the second energy level? No. Third energy level, do we add anything? We have the D's, which can hold 10, as can every other energy level above that. And the fourth, we add the 
F's. Now, it would be easy if we're trying to house electrons and we had to fill up, you know, 90 electrons if we just go, okay, 2, 4, 10, 12, 18, 28, and just fill from top to bottom, left to right. But it doesn't work that way because of some of the physics behind it. So we go ahead and draw this slant diagram. Yes, it does. Mm -hmm. okay. Rather than filling from left to right, top to bottom, it fills from according to the slant diagram, which is the same as left to right up until you get to the 4, because 3, 4S, 3D, yeah, the 3D, the 3D fills before the 4P. That's the first time it gets out of order. But So using the slant diagram, if this is the way you, and I, I did ask some of your classmates, and there are a couple people in here that they understand this, better than the periodic table method. So I want to do this one more time as well, just to confirm in your mind that you understand it. When you're building the electron configuration for an atom and you're counting up and filling all these addresses, you start from the arrow and go to the head and then go from the end to the head all the way until you count up the appropriate number of electrons. So you fill the 1s1 or 1s shell first, which means if I only had one, it would be 1s1, but I can have up to two. So if I maximize how many each can hold, this would be two, four, 10, 12, 18, 20, and it fills in that order, okay? So this would look like 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p6, 4s2, 3d10, 3d10, 4p6, 5s2, 4d10, and so on. Okay, so the numbers don't just simply go ones, then twos, then threes. Once you get past three p, then it's excuse me. Once you get past four s, then you start backtracking on the energy levels according to this slant diagram. Now the other way to understand this slant diagram is to just simply use the periodic table, remembering that helium is actually should be over here, and it's, its valence electron is in the 1s2 position. So for purposes of valence electrons, helium goes over here. That every element that exists in the first column exists in that column there. Valence electron is in the s1 position. Here it's 1s1, here it's 2s1, 3s1, and so on, all the way to 7s1. Over here, everything in the second column, including helium now, is their valence electron is in the S2 position, meaning the S1 is already full, but they also have an S2 in the first, second, third, and so on on the different energy levels. The same is with P's and the D's. What is the trick, though, when you fill across? Remember, the first one just has S, which we see. The second one has S and P. The third one has S and then P. The fourth one has S, and then we run into the D block. What is the fundamental technique you need to remember to determine Subtracting one from the energy level. So if we filled up to this point, it'd be 4s1, 4s2. Now it's going to be 3d1, 3d2, and count up from there. So you get to the end. Once you get through the d block and go back to the p block, go back to your original energy level. What is the title for that row? Four. So you only subtract one when you're in the d segment right there. The final thing we did was abbreviated electron configurations. To get the abbreviated electron configuration, what we would do is take whatever element we're under consideration. If I were to say barium, I think that's what we used yesterday, cesium, any, any one of these elements, any element actually, the technique, the simplest technique is to go up one, one row and go all the way to the end and find the noble gas over here, column eight. You're going to learn later something called the octet rule. And the octet rule says, and this is where we personify things again, but the octet rule is going to say that elements like to have, in most cases, with a few exceptions, they like to have eight electrons in their valence shell. They like to have a, 
an S and a P shell full, basically what it comes down to. And so those noble gases are very, very stable. They don't want to react with anything unless they're forced to by us pumping a lot of energy into them. So what we do is go, whatever we're considering, we go up one row and all the way to the right, and we write down that noble gas. We put it in brackets. In the case of, let's say we're doing rubidium, then we all go Superman here and go Krypton. We put Krypton over there. And then we count up our configuration from that point. So if we put Krypton, we've already accounted for 36 of the electrons. We only have, if we're doing rubidium, we only have one more electron to account for, right? Where does that electron reside? Where, what's its address? 5s1 orbital. So I could, if I'm asked for the electron configuration of rubidium, I would have to either, I would have to write this all the way out to 5s1. That would account for all my electrons, but I could also shorthand it if I'm, if I'm told. You'll be told either write the full electron configuration or write the abbreviated configuration. If you're given the option to write the, the abbreviated configuration and you already had the full one written out, all you'd have to do is go back to Krypton here and say, you know what? Another way for me to write all of that is to write that. If I write Krypton in brackets, it represents 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p6, 4s2, 3d10, 4p6. All of that is represented by this. And then I just add whatever additional I have to my last noble guess. Are there any questions on that? Process make sense? I mean, how to determine that? And again, the only thing that we haven't, I believe, haven't covered in detail is to actually do more of the math problems, which are tedious. That's why I would encourage you tonight, I would encourage you to look at both on your own 3, 4, and 3, 5. And I'm pretty sure 3, 4, and 3, 5 on your own, those are dealing primarily with the, C, the, the light formula, C equals lambda F. Then also looking at on your own 3, 6, and 3, 7, These two are looking at the first formula of light. The second one is looking at the, s the energy equation for light. Um, again, the on your owns are in the book. The answers are in the book. Try them. See if you got them right. And study the answers so that you understand why you got them wrong and how you're going to get them right as part of the quiz tomorrow. Yes, I did tell William I was considering a quiz today. Basically, it was going to be based on how this review went. If there was not any attention, if you're sleeping, if you know, there wasn't any nonverbal feedback, I'd just say, fine, you already think you know it. Here's your quiz. Take your books and turn to, and here are the numbers we were going to quiz on. But today, you all seem relatively motivated to pay attention. So we did the review today, the quiz tomorrow. Okay. Don't think some stuff like this doesn't affect how we run each day, okay? Now, I am looking at possibly starting at the next module, taking the review questions, practice problems, and start breaking them up and having homework due throughout the module a little at a time. I'm going to try to move to that. But I need, it takes a long time to actually do that because I've got to be able to pull apart you know, what have we covered in class at that point, what haven't we covered to that point. But I think I'm going to try to move to that so you have a little bit more homework, have it more consistently, but not be as much. Because you know? right now, I, I, I personally don't mind saying, hey, you've got this due in two weeks, again, but that's the routine I'm in at school, you know. John, you've got this paper due, it's due in three months, go. And you've got to pace yourself, because if you don't start right away, you won't get it done. But I do also think that you guys hopefully agree, you need to be pressed a little bit in the middle to realize, hey, I don't know this. And just to figure out for yourself, hey, I don't know this, and I should know this by now. I don't want you to think that you can put off knowing this stuff till the last minute and do well on the tests. So I'll play with that a little bit and see if we can come up with something a little bit different. I do want to be able to put more grades in as you go. I know some of you are athletes, for example. 
it's really hard to change your grade in here if we don't have anything that's graded till every other week. So as much as you might agonize over tests, again, the tests and the quizzes and things like that are really designed for you to show that you know something, and for some of you, so you can play sport, so you can get back on the team. I mean, I actually do want to, and I do want you to be on, I do want you to be on the sport, but I do want you to know the material too. So I'm not going to teach to the test, and I'm not going to, you know, give you grades just so you can play. At the same time, I'm sympathetic, so we'll figure it out. We have a couple more minutes. You're free to quietly talk and study hall if you'd like until the end of the period.